Today we're discussing severe allergic reactions, which we would call anaphylactic shock or anaphylaxis. We're gonna discuss what's actually happening in the body during anaphylaxis, and then the proper treatments to be able to treat this type of disease. So let's discuss allergic reactions first. So basic allergic reactions are when your body has a reaction to some foreign antigen or some foreign body that's not supposed to be in your body. The body is sending healing properties uh, to that site to try to fight off this thing that's not supposed to be there and then also to start to heal the body in that area. Localized and minor allergic reactions are fairly common and one example of this would be something such as poison ivy. In poison ivy, you're exposed to this poison on this plant um, it gets into your body and then you start to have some hives and some breakout um, from that and the, you'll have some swelling as well as the body is now working to get rid of that poison that's in the body. So let's talk a little bit about why we have some of the swelling and why we're seeing some of these symptoms during an allergic reaction or even just in healing or the body's process of healing itself. Your body has a whole host of different cells that work to be able to uh, fight off infection, fight off foreign bodies, and be able to heal itself. But we're gonna take just a closer look at a couple specifics. Um, if you wanna dive further into this, there's a bunch of YouTube videos out there that will explain this in further detail. But in short, we have mast cells in our body. And these mast cells will release histamines when there is some sort of foreign body or some invasion that the body wants to fight off and get rid of. So after we have these histamines released, what the histamines do is they make it easier for all the body's natural healing properties to be able to function. So these histamines will cause a vasodilation. And when we have vasodilation means an enlargement of the vessel, the blood vessel. So as we have blood vessels in that particular area of injury that will dilate and open up, it increases the permeability of the cell wall. The permeability basically means that now we can get healing properties that travel in the blood through the cell wall to leak through the cells to the area of injury to be able to fight off that infection. When we have things leaking from the vessels into those uh, cells, that's a good thing because that means that now we're getting those healing properties where they need to be, but it also is what we see as inflammation or swelling. So if you have an injured area of your body and you notice swelling, it's because the histamines have now opened up that vessel, allowed the healing properties to move through, and then we get swelling as a result of that. Now, while all of these steps are part of the body's natural response to be able to heal itself, to be able to fight off foreign infections or foreign invaders that come into the body, the problem becomes when our body kicks into overdrive. And now we've done all these things like dilating vessels and increasing swelling, um, increasing heart rate, decreasing blood pressure. Now, while all these different things that the body is doing to heal itself is great, and that's part of the process of your body being able to fight off infection, the problem comes when our body overreacts. When our body overreacts, we see this histamine release go crazy, and we see a lot of vessels dilate, not just the ones at the particular site of injury. Or if we get a bee sting, and now this is circulating in our body, it can cause a histamine release in a lot of places rather than just localized at the area of injury. So once we have a response to this foreign invasion that is across the body, we call this a systemic response. The whole system, the whole body is now seeing the effects of this. A lot of people can have a systemic response and still have minor symptoms from that. But some people's body will kick into overdrive and will be throwing all sorts of extra histamines and healing properties in an abundance at this issue. And that's when we go from just a simple allergic reaction to anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock. The determining property between a simple allergic reaction and a life-threatening anaphylactic episode or anaphylaxis would be the vital signs that accompany that. If you've watched any of my previous videos, you know I'm big on vital signs. Getting those vital signs to see what the body's actually doing and then trending that over time to see if we're getting better or worse or staying the same. A body's vital signs can give us good insight as to what the body is fighting 
how hard it's fighting and how far along in this process we are and how much time we have to be able to provide treatments for a patient. So what do the vital signs look like when we're looking at something that is more of anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock rather than simply just an allergic reaction? Well, as we already talked about, those histamines cause a vasodilation. So our blood vessels just got bigger, but we didn't increase our blood in any way. So the fluid, the amount of volume in our body stays the same, but our vessels just got bigger, which means there's not as much pressure in our vasculatory system. So now our pressure is gonna go down. So as our blood pressure starts to drop, our body compensates for that by increasing our heart rate. It says, oh, we need more blood pressure. Let's beat the heart faster to try to get that pressure back up. So our body's starting to compensate. Blood pressure starts to lower, heart rate starts to increase. If this continues and we still don't have uh, a vascular response to increase that blood pressure more, the blood pressure is gonna continue to drop and that's a bad sign. So another effect that this anaphylaxis has on our system is it constricts our airways. So when it takes our airways and our, the smooth muscles in our airways constrict down, it decreases the amount of air that we can move through our lungs. As we decrease that amount of air, our body wants to compensate by making us breathe more often since each breath doesn't have as much air. So now we get rapid, shallow breathing. This increases our respiratory rate, and we're gonna notice that on a patient that is having anaphylactic shock, and they will look like they're severely short of breath at this point as well. So determining factors for someone that is in anaphylactic shock, we're gonna to start to see a little bit of a dip in a blood pressure, but the body's gonna compensate it first by increasing the heart rate. But you're, they're also gonna have increased respiratory rate and severe shortness of breath. Then over time, if the body cannot sustain the blood pressure, you will see the blood pressure drop while the heart rate is still elevated. Anytime you see a type of shock where the blood pressure starts to drop, that's not a good sign. And that's what we would call decompensated shock. That either means that you're really late to the game as far as a treatment plan goes, or whatever happened to that patient is so severe that the body cannot compensate on its own to keep that blood pressure up. These are true life-threatening emergencies and we need to make sure that we begin treatment as soon as possible for these patients. So let's talk a little bit about the treatment process for anaphylaxis. Some things you can do yourself and then other things that healthcare providers will do to assist you uh, once you have help from professionals. Before we jump into the treatments, I do want to take a minute to say this is not medical training. This is for informational purposes only. This is not a replacement for an in-person class, for a medical license, none of that. So make sure that you are properly trained and that you have proper licensure for any procedures you're going to try. Um, and if you are doing something on your own at home or if you are uh, in need of an EpiPen, make sure that you are going through a physician, get a prescription for those EpiPens. Um, we are not giving you license to do anything crazy or aside from uh, medical control in this video. All right, so we already talked about anaphylaxis being a overstimulation of the healing properties of the body in response to some foreign body or object or poison or something that is now in the body. The body wants to take care of it, but it overreacts. It overreacts and now we have some severe side effects from that overreaction that now can cause secondary problems like shortness of breath, swelling of the airway, uh, decreased blood pressure. And we have to counteract those things quickly before the body just goes totally haywire. First things first, the most important aspect of treating a patient is to stop whatever the problem is. If they're bleeding, we have to stop the bleeding. If they're having an allergic reaction, let's get them away from the thing they're allergic to. So if they are allergic to a chemical or a fertilizer or something that's topical on the skin, get that off. If it's a dry powder, brush it off. If it's a wet liquid, use copious amounts of water to flush that off their skin. But we've got to remove this poison or this attacking substance from the body so that the body can settle down a little bit and not continue to increase the immune response to that foreign body. In the case of a bee sting, what you wanna do is you wanna use something like a credit card um, or a flat, hard uh, plastic substance, um, scrape it over the skin back and forth to try to remove that stinger. A lot of times the stinger still has the poison sac still attached to it. If you hook it with tweezers to try to pull it out, a lot of times you'll inject the rest of that poison into the wound, thus complicating matters. So use something to scrape across the skin and try to remove that stinger. Once the stinger's out, uh, we can continue on with the treatment. 
the fastest thing that we can give a patient to combat this and the best drug of choice to combat this is epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is essentially adrenaline. It's naturally occurring in our bodies. When you get that scare and your heart rate rises and you feel all weird, that's a dump of adrenaline in your system. It puts your body into a fight or flight mode. It increases your senses. It allows you to re respond to life-threatening events. And that is what we are gonna use now, injected into the body to be able to help fight some of these things. Now we have receptors in our body called alpha receptors and beta receptors, and there's different types of these receptors as well. In short, to keep this simple, epinephrine is an agonist on these receptors. It stimulates these receptors and allows our body to do certain things. Some of those things it does are, it will increase heart rate, that's normal. And that is the body's response to try to compensate for whatever's going on. Well, our heart rate's probably already gonna be increased with anaphylactic shock. So while it is something that's happening to the body, it's not necessarily what we're exactly intending for it to happen, but it is something that is happening when we give epi. Now, some of the intended consequences of giving epi would be a vasoconstriction. So it acts on the vessels to squeeze them back. Because remember those histamines made them open up. So now we are giving epi to squeeze them back, increase blood pressure, give that vascular resistance back to the body so we can have a good blood pressure to be able to perfuse our vital organs. Another thing that epinephrine does is it actually relaxes the airways and opens the airways, allowing us to be able to get good deep breaths. By constricting down the vessels, we also decrease the permeability of the vessel walls, thus decreasing some of the swelling that we're seeing from this allergic reaction as well. Let me take just a moment and say that if you're finding anything in this video useful, we'd really appreciate a like on this video. That would help us out. And if you have any questions over the stuff we're going over, feel free to leave a comment below. We love hearing from you, getting feedback uh, from you, and a lot of times we take that feedback and put that into future content and videos as well. If you're not already subscribed, hit the subscribe button and make sure your notifications are on so you're notified when we release any future videos. There's a fine line between when you need to administer epinephrine versus when you need to remove this substance that is causing the issue. If you don't remove the substance, then the body will continue to attack it and you'll have further problems. But if you spend a long time trying to remove all the substance and the patient's going downhill and you don't administer epinephrine, you're going to have issues there as well. But you also have to keep yourself safe if you're administering aid to someone else so you don't get involved in whatever that substance is. Um, if you are allergic to bees and now you're standing over a beehive providing care to somebody, well, then you could end up being a patient as well. So you do have to make sure that the scene is safe to operate in, that you're not going to cause any further harm to the patient, that the patient's not going to continue to go downhill because of what they are touching or where they are at or uh, the ability to get stung further or the food that they may be around that they're allergic to. So we need to remove them from that and then begin treatment. But make sure you don't delay that treatment too long because they do need to get epinephrine on board to fix these problems. All right, so let's take a minute to go over how to administer an EpiPen. Healthcare providers will have a, a vial of Epi they will draw up into a syringe. They'll administer that into the deltoid or the shoulder muscle. But when you have an Epi pin that a physician uh, prescribes you, you pick up and you keep with you, um, it's administered a little bit differently. This can be administered through clothes, so no need to remove the clothes to be able to get to the um, site. This is already a metered dose, so it gives you a prescribed amount. Um, and all you have to do is make contact with the muscle where you need to inject it press and hold for several seconds to make sure that it gets fully administered and then pull it back out. There's a basically a syringe inside here that's spring loaded and when you activate it, it will use that spring to push the plunger and to administer that medication and it stops at a certain point to make sure that you don't get too large of a dose. This is a trainer. There is no epinephrine inside. There is no needle in the end, so it's completely safe to use and to train with. Now for how to use it. Take this out of the package. You'll notice a cap on one side that needs to be removed. This is a safety cap that prevents this from being used until this cap is removed. If the cap is in there, you can't get the needle to come out. So that has to be removed to allow it to operate. Now, when we're operating this, grasp this in your hand with both ends sticking out. There's several stories of people that have put their thumb over one end and they just happen to have this backwards. They weren't paying attention, they had it backwards because they just removed a cap. So they thought, well, that's gotta be the end it comes out of, right? That's a safety cap. And then they do this and the needle goes through their thumb. And so now the person trying to administer care actually got the dose of epi, or it just went clean through their thumb and no one got any of the epi. And then the person that actually needs the epi now doesn't have any epi. 
So grab this this way, make sure you have the right end. There's instructions all over this thing on how to use it. So make sure the end is going the right way. Remove the cap, grab it in your hand like this. And now we're going to administer this directly into the outside of the upper thigh. So your thigh muscle is the largest muscle in your body. Muscles have blood vessels. And so when we inject this into the muscle, it's gonna be the fastest, quickest route to get that from the muscle, absorbed into the bloodstream and distributed out to the entire body. So we're gonna take this, we're gonna press it into the skin. We're gonna press and hold for about 10 seconds. It usually doesn't take near that long, but we wanna make sure that all the epinephrine is allowed to be able to be pushed into the muscle. And so we want to make sure we hold that for 10 seconds to make sure that actually happens. After the EpiPen has been activated, and once you release it, this will pop out to cover up the needle and then it keeps it from being used again. It's a one-time use, although there are some EpiPens now that have a second dose built into them. Now there are some cool tricks if you are out in the backwoods and you're very limited and you need a second dose. There is still more epinephrine in here and there's some cool tricks to be able to open these packages up, draw the epi off of them, or continue to reset the system inside and get multiple doses from the inside system. There's a couple different methods. Um, I'll leave a link to two of those videos down below. They use slightly different methods for being able to utilize the epi that is still inside. But do keep in mind to use aseptic technique, keep everything sterile, and this is for emergency use only. Don't recommend this for everyday care, especially for professionals providing care uh, to someone else. So epinephrine is our frontline drug for anaphylaxis. We stop the process from getting worse. We give epinephrine to be able to immediately counteract some of the side effects that we are seeing from this anaphylaxis. Then there are some other things that we can do and give this patient to allow the body to continue to calm down some of its uh, immune response that has gone haywire. And one of those things that we're going to give next, especially as healthcare providers, would be Benadryl. So you may have taken some Benadryl in the past if you've had allergic reaction or some poison ivy or something, and that will basically slow down some of this swelling. Now, the way that Benadryl works is it's a histamine blocker. So remember those histamines we were talking about that cause the vessel enlargement, permeability, swelling, all that fun stuff? Well, this blocks that response. So now not only are we constricting the vessels down with the epi, but now we're also giving Benadryl, which is gonna block some of those histamines and prevent those histamines from having a further response in the system. Now you have a couple different types of histamine receptors in your body. Benadryl will have effect on an H1, but you also have some H2. So you will also see healthcare providers giving Pepsid to a patient that has a allergic reaction because Pepsid is an H2 blocker. So not only are we blocking the histamines from H1, we're also blocking the H2 histamines. And so now we kind of have a complete package of the Benadryl and the Pepsid working together for a full blockage of these histamines. Healthcare professionals may also at this point get some steroids. Steroids basically suppress your immune system, which in this case is exactly what we want to happen. Our immune system has gone haywire. Steroids will act on that immune system, suppress that so that the body is not continuing to uh, have this overreaction. There are a couple other treatments that may be done on a professional level as well, such as albuterol. Albuterol is a targeted uh, beta agonist, which will be inhaled. It goes directly into the lungs and it starts to work on the beta receptors in the lungs by opening those lungs back up and increasing the amount of oxygen flow to the lungs and hopefully decreasing some of the shortness of breath in these patients. So as we conclude our video today, let's do a quick recap. We talked about uh, allergic reactions versus anaphylaxis. Remember that anaphylactic shock is when we have a low blood pressure and we have a vital sign change uh, that is now showing that our body is actually kicking into overdrive rather than just a normal response to fight some foreign body. We then looked a little bit more of the pathophysiology of mast cells and histamines and what that means in the body and how that directly relates to our vital signs. And then we took a look at some of the treatment options for this. The main treatment option for someone that is not a medical professional would be an EpiPen. So if you have an allergic reaction um, or susceptibility to uh, anaphylactic shock, make sure you see a physician, get prescribed an EpiPen, keep one of these with you so you will have a way to combat this if this happens to you. We also took a look at some of the other drugs that healthcare professionals uh, will give and especially ones that will be used in the ER once you get to the ER uh, for sustained treatment for this anaphylaxis. One of the best ways to uh, treat any type of illness is prevention. And so the ways that we can prevent this are by knowing what you're allergic to and trying to avoid some of those. There's also some treatment out there that will take small doses of whatever you're allergic to and give those to you small 
mounts at a time so your body becomes more used to it and doesn't have the crazy inflammatory response when you have a large amount of that poison toxin foreign body in your system. So that is also an option if you have current allergies and a way that you can uh, start to train your body over time so that it doesn't have these massive immune responses. Well, that's it for today. Hope you found this video helpful. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.